Hi, and a very warm welcome to this special interview with Lodovic von Asher, who is the leader of the PV, PMBPA, the Dutch Labour Party. And we're going to be talking today about how the pandemic is changing politics, about the future of Europe and what role the Netherlands will play in a post-Brexit Britain, and above all about how to go about rebuilding uh, winning coalitions for the centre-left. Um, very warm welcome to you, Lodovic. Thank you, Mark. Nice talking to you. So you're sitting in a slightly socially distanced place in Amsterdam at the moment, and you've written about how the world uh, of COVID uh, feels fundamentally different from the world before and how we're going to find it hard to understand what the world before even looked like having lived through, through the last few months. Do you want to lay out a few of your thoughts about what you think has changed structurally for, for, for politics in this, in this new era? Sure, yes, I'm, I'm at a, in a hotel right now in Amsterdam, helping them out a little bit and, and that way I can talk to you guys uh, without my three kids screaming in the background, uh, as is, I'm sure, quite familiar to most of our viewers uh, working from home. Uh, well, I wrote this essay a little over a month ago about the post-COVID world because I think this is, this is a time where uh, politicians, but also policymakers and thinkers from the centre-left need to you know, step up and try to, to draw down our ideas about the post-COVID world. And the first question, of course, you ask is, uh, what's so different? What's so special? Uh, I think, especially for the younger generation, this is a crazy time. They, you know, they lived through two once-in-a-lifetime crises in, in a span of 12 years. And this, this one even bigger than, than the last one, uh, the biggest one since World War II, uh, uh, it's safe to say. And structural change, I think, will be uh, on the way we look at our governments. Um, you know, we've lived through a number of decades where the main message was uh, smaller government, uh, liberalization, uh, markets are better. And of course, there, there was a lot of criticism and alternatives, but that was the main orthodoxy. And, and right now, in the, min, in the middle of such a crisis, a government decides everything, uh, takes away our freedoms, um, here in the Netherlands, people are listening with millions to press conferences of our prime minister. Uh, that, that tells you two things, that change is possible, much more drastic change is possible than we, than we used to think. Second, that the role of government will change. And third, uh, and that's, you know, that's why, where we have to act, really, in, in, instead of just observe what's happening. I think the effect of this crisis is very asymmetrical. Um, you, you can see big differences between countries, of course, but especially within countries. Uh, if you have a secure income or a secure job and a nice house, uh, you can complain about your children in the background, but, but you can protect yourself against the, the virus and you can protect yourself against the economic fallout. But uh, in my country, in the first weeks, Many, many, many people who are self-employed or were, were in flexible contracts were fired immediately. Uh, we see that minorities are affected much worse than, than, uh, than other groups, frontline workers. Uh, and that, that gives you also a look into the future. That means that if we do not act, if we do not make political choices about this, the post-COVID world will be um, more unequal will be uh, with bigger differences, will be with less opportunity, will be, I think, more of a free-for-all capitalist world instead of this, you know, using this momentum. So I think that's, that's structural. And if you want to look what could happen, look at the United States and in, for some instances also to the UK. And that's also where I think it's, it's an imperative to, for us to, to draw up a common agenda how to you know approach this crisis on the shorter term protecting jobs protecting uh, the the income basic income for for people living through this crisis and on the middle term trying to win elections about it and the longer term if you want a fairer society and there were enough problems as it were before corona and covid uh, then we need to be more ambitious and more radical in our solutions and as a final thing will be a grave mistake to just take this one crisis at a time. Uh, we cannot afford that. We cannot postpone uh, tackling one crisis uh, over the other. So we have to be aware that it's a health crisis, an economic crisis, a social crisis, and a climate crisis. 
so it's, you know, interesting times to be in politics. So you put this in the context of, of some of the earlier crises. I remember after the Lehman Brothers, um, you know, there were a lot of people who were saying some of the things that you were saying uh, about this crisis, that it showed, first of all, that the state had to go back because ultimately the state had to bail out all the banks um, and to, to stop uh, economies just completely seizing up. They also said that um, uh, it, it revealed structural inequalities and there were big debates about how austerity should work, should it be introduced at all, and who should bear the costs of, of austerity if it did come in. Um, and also uh, these sort of calls for radicalism, a remaking of capitalism, uh, I think uh, the Communist Manifesto uh, re uh, returned to the bestsellers list after, <laughs> after many years where uh, it had been languishing um, unread in bookshops in different places. And then, in fact, ended up being more of a, of a boon to the, to the right, uh, not just the centre right, but even uh, you know, the kind of extreme populist right uh, then to the, to the left. Um, and in many ways, Trump and, and Boris Johnson even have, have been better at capturing some of the anger and the discontent that came out of that financial crisis than a lot of the centre-left parties. Why do you think this time is going to be different? Well, first of all, uh, uh, you're right. The Communist Manifesto was, was writing the bestseller list, but, but so was Mein Kampf at one stage. So we should just not <laughs> put our hopes in, in what books people want to read in, during crisis times. Uh, I think in, we have to, you know, look in, into the mirror to uh, to see what 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 went wrong with the last crisis. I was deputy prime minister between 2012 and 2017 in the coalition government with our conservative slash liberal party, uh, and we did some really good things. We we made sure that that stock owners would not be bailed out the next time, but we also were part of an austerity government, and that's where we lost a lot of trust uh, among our voters. So we lost the general election in 2017. And I think there's a number of lessons to be learned. First of all, um, it's not going to, um, you know, if you fix the economy, it's not automatically going to become more just. Just adding jobs or adding growth uh, might just as well make sure that, that inequality will be on the rise. And if you, even if you focus on that, and we did focus on income inequality, and uh, we tried, you know, and we were quite successful in keeping that within certain brackets, that still doesn't mean that, that opportunity will be equal or that, that wealth will be spread equal. Uh, and now that this crisis is hitting us, we are very, very much aware of this. And, and the labor market is, I think, a clear example of that. The labor market has been so polarized that even though people uh, were seeing some improvement in their income, uh, they're, they're much more vulnerable than, than others. So as, at the center left, uh, I think there's a, there's a lesson to be learned there, that, that we need to step out of the, the orthodoxy that was still very much about, um, you know, trying to rebalance the budget, trying to, to you know, prevent the debt from, from running too high. Of course, it was also difficult, a different crisis, uh, because there was a clear uh, wrongdoer. There was the in, irresponsible behavior of banks and, and investors and bankers, uh, and that caused some serious problems, and then it spilled over to the eurozone and the and the debt crisis. Um, so we also had to look into debt and repair debt. And we've been, I think, by and large, we've been at least a bit successful in, in preventing that from from happening again. This time, it's it's different. It's a virus. It's nobody's fault, even though Trump would like us to believe so. Uh, and so we have to deal with it, and and it makes it maybe more easy to have the political debate on, on uh, where to go from here. However, I am convinced that if we do not, as the center-left, offer a, a clear positive alternative, instead of just, well, you know, we're going to try to protect you, but, but a more positive uh, vision for our future, uh, even more people will, will, you know, try and find their, their hope with, with populists or the populist right. And that, that's happening all over the Western world, in the UK, in the Netherlands, in America. Uh, so we should not be naive about this. But I think at the same time, if we do learn our lessons without you know, uh, taking all the blame, because we did some tremendous good things, to, to quote uh, Trump, and we did help uh, um, 
rebuild stability and protect jobs. But we do have to look in the mirror and learn from our mistakes and offer a much more ambitious agenda uh, in order to, to make sure that, that progress uh, comes back instead of just, well, you know, struggling through. So I want to, to come a bit later on to this whole question about how to rebuild the center left because you had As a politician, a I immediately go there. Sorry about that. No, no. I mean, I think one of the reasons why people are so interested to hear, uh, to talk to you is because you've been through this roller coaster ride as a party where you were part of the, the, the solution to the last crisis and got punished very badly for it. Yes. Like a phoenix seems to be rising from the ashes uh, again. Um, but um, maybe before we go to, to the future of the center left, we can talk a bit about Europe and the Euro crisis, because you mentioned that as well. Um, the Netherlands uh, is now this post Brexit, one of the six big uh, member states of the European Union. Um, your prime minister, who uh, was your prime minister when you were when you were deputy prime minister as well, so you know him much better than than, than, uh, than most people do, um, is now one of the power players in the in the European Union um, and is one of the leaders, not just of the Hanseatic League, but but more recently of the Frugal Four, and has been waging something of a jihad against um, the against Corona bonds, against the idea of uh, of a transfer union. Um, It'd be interesting to hear again how you think that the Corona crisis has has changed the debate about the future of Europe, because the Netherlands um, obviously uh, has always been one of the the, the more uh, fiscally orthodox uh, countries within the eurozone uh, for a long time. One of your colleagues in the PMVDA was was chairing the Euro Group. Um, uh, so you, you've been kind of key players, but you've been at one sort of extreme of the, uh, of the, of the debate about the future of the Eurozone and, and uh, how it's run. Um, just wondering how you see uh, things going forward, whether you think it was right for the Netherlands to take such a tough stance during the first, uh, well, when you, were, when you were in government and when you're in power, whether you've had any kind of more thoughts about that and whether you think that, um, there needs to be a rethink now post COVID, um, particularly as, as you know, what you were saying earlier about there being kind of clear villains before and less villains now. I think there is a sense that, that, that interestingly, some of the countries that are hardest hit by COVID were also hardest hit by the Euro crisis. But this time round, you don't have the same sort of moral, uh, moral politique attached to it, which was definitely part of the debate in Germany, but I think to a degree also in your own country. Yeah. Um, anyway, sorry, that was a very long question. Um, but yeah, <laughs> you, <laughs> why don't I let you answer it? It's a good question, though. And, and I think, uh, you know, we have the summit coming up uh, about the future of Europe and the recovery. So it's a quite, quite urgent uh, question to, uh, to ask ourselves and, and, and to discuss. I think looking back, um, we, can, we can easily say that the instruments that were in place in the uh, Growth and Stability Pact were not really nuanced and subtle enough to, to really help countries. So th we did succeed by and large to stabilize the Eurozone and, and to save the currency, uh, but it came at a high price, uh, especially in, in countries like Greece where youth unemployment was, was so dramatic. Uh, so I think, you know, looking back, we all want to do better uh, this time. And, and one thing that that I'm happy about is that that uh, that everybody seems to understand that you cannot just say, well, three percent or or uh, the sixty percent threshold for for state debt is leading now because it's such an enormous crisis. Uh, I think it, the Netherlands and that's that's cross party has always been quite uh, conservative about debt and about um, you know being careful with your money and, and about reforms. However, this time around, I think it was a, a grave mistake uh, by, by our current government to, to be so harsh when, when asked for help uh, at the time of need, when, when Spain and Italy were, were literally seeing, you know, uh, the army coming in to, to help bury the dead in such a crisis. If, if people ask for help, you help because your neighbors, you're in the same union and, and, and I think 
um, the debate should not be about corona bonds. It should be about what's, need, what's needed and how can we finance that and what instruments are necessary. So I'm, I'm afraid that they, they did damage not only to the, the way the Netherlands are viewed in Europe, but also to, to Europe itself by behaving that way. Uh, however, I can see there's a gradual change. Uh, we had a parliamentary debate about it yesterday. Uh, I took the position that, we, that solidarity is in our national interest here, uh, that, that for our economy, it's, it's quite evident that the European economy needs to grow. And that I think that it's actually a malicious kind of framing to, to keep repeating uh, prejudice about Southern Europe or about, you know, uh, making these, these horror stories about the transfer union while we're here, we have a common problem and that needs a common solution. And I think it's really either work together and, and solve this or go, go down on our own. But I could see that the language is changing from our government. There's, there's much more, uh, I think, understanding for the need of compromise. Uh, I'll talk to, to some of the, the leaders uh, later this afternoon in preparation of, of, of the summit. And I would, I would sincerely hope uh, that, I, I guess not this summit, but, but in the summer, on the summer in the next summit, we will find a solution. Because uh, also, you know, for trust, in, in the ability of Europe to, to tackle such a crisis, it's needed that there's a serious recovery. And how However, there, there also, we have, we have to very, be very careful where all the money is going, uh, because then even if we succeed to, you know, to make a big, big program, um, you know, we have to be a bit critical on how it is spent. And that's where I think some you know, mutual criticism can be helpful. Because, because we want it to be used to protect jobs, to help the poor, uh, to protect uh, economic security, and not to, to flow into uh, to the hands of, of corrupt leaders or in the, in the hands of, of big corporations that really do not need the money. And I can say this because in my country with the big, first big support uh, plan, we saw that that many people were left out that they would desperately need the money in that a company like booking.com i'm sure you are aware of that company that had paid over 8 billion euros to its stock owners in the last fiscal year was one of the first to come and say well we need your help so we can we need recovery we need to do this together in europe solidarity has to be part of it uh, i think it has to be loans and grants uh, but then we have to be very strict on how the money is spent and make sure that it's actually to benefiting the people that are in need of help. And then Europe can come out stronger. Uh, so it's once again, we're in such a phase where, uh, where it's quite important. And, and I do my best as, a, as an opposition party to try and, and move our uh, government to, uh, towards compromise. So it, it sounds like there's sort of two angles. Here. One is that solidarity is a bit of a toxic frame and there might be better to make the case in terms of self-interest. I was wondering to what extent the uh, way that people look at China and America and the fears about globalization may be going into reverse and a need for us to, to therefore re rely more on, on a European market than global markets could actually help um, create a sense in, in the Netherlands that, that having a short-term injection of capital into a lot of the countries in the single market could mean that jobs don't disappear and that that will create much more demand for, for Dutch products, given what a huge percentage of Dutch exports go to the single market. Yeah, over 70%. Um, well, I think the, the geopolitics is almost absent in the debate. And it's actually quite strange because for, for a very small country like the Netherlands, it's of the utmost importance to understand what's happening in the world, to understand what's changing, to, to understand how China is using uh, its, its you know, force and diplomacy to, to take another position in the world and, and how we see that the United States under Trump is actually vacating the role of, of leader of the free world. Um, so, you know, we either uh, are, you know, trying to be leader of the free world in Europe or we're just a pawn on this big, big chessboard that, that the big players are, are playing on. And, you know, uh, if we didn't, you know, grasp 
how big the changes are, Brexit should present us with, a, with a quite a clear warning. Uh, it's not always automatically going in the right direction. Um, if we do not present a clear vision on how we're also going to improve Europe, make Europe more social, more about progress, uh, then people will take their disappointment and, and vote accordingly. And then you could also weaken Europe. So, if, especially for the Netherlands, because we trade a lot, not only with the internal market of Europe, but also with the UK. It's very, you know, uh, it's a clear case that we need a very strong Europe, both politically and economically. Uh, so it's my, you know, responsibility together with others to, to make sure that the debate is not only about what we contribute uh, to the next Euro European budget uh, over the next seven years, but that we also understand how, how so much of, of our way of life is depending on, on being protected in a, in a cooperation of European nations. And that, you know, as Corona has showed us that, that, that health is fragile, uh, the changes in the world should show us that, that also security, international cooperation uh, is also fragile and that you have to regroup and understand that to work with France and Germany in building a more democratic, uh, but also more socially progressive Europe is actually also helping you know, to, to secure us from threats, to, to, to solve the big problems of the world and, and safeguard our, our economy, maybe not for next year, but, but for the next decade. So you have elections coming up um, in the Netherlands, um, and we're sort of seeing a strain. I mean, in a way, um, the Dutch political system is is always like a portal into the future for many of the rest of us. A lot of the trends which end up afflicting other countries happen first in the Netherlands, and the populism is one of these things which you see go through all sorts of different forms. It's strange to see that the Gert Wilders seems to be back uh, in the front line of Dutch politics at the moment. You have Thierry Baudet as well, a different kind of populist, anti-European politician. And you're trying to rethink um, a political strategy for your own party. Can you tell us a bit more about how you're thinking about the, the kind of future dynamics in Dutch politics and what sort of coalitions um, might emerge uh, out of this new political setup that we're in? Yeah. Well, we have a wonderful system, I, I think, because it's very open. It, it's very low threshold. So basically, if there, there's a party for every opinion, uh, and, and it's, it's not so hard to enter parliament. And that, of course, it's sometimes difficult in practice, but it means that, that you know, the system is quite flexible in, in, in adapting uh, public opinion or waves of thought in, in our country. So I think in the long term, that, that provides us with, with a lot of stability, strange enough. And, and we also have different brands of, of populism to offer to the world. So come and take a look. Uh, <laughs> as for my party, you, you mentioned this already, we were, we were not, not punished, but we were crushed during the last general election in, uh, in 2017. I was leading the party, so I was the one suffering that defeat. It was enormous. I think it will be uh, the, the record defeat forever in, in Dutch history. However, <laughs> as one does, uh, you, you take a blow and you try to learn from it and you, and you uh, start over again. And it also provided us with some clear insight in, in what our voters expect from us and, and uh, want from us, demand from us, and we're not getting. So we, we focus on, on security um, as, as our basic promise, security of income, security in jobs, uh, to feel secure in, 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 in the way you live your life. Uh, and, and part of the analysis was that in the 90s where, where you know, every, everything seemed fine, you know, the, the post-political world, we had drifted away too, too much from, from those basic promises that, that progressives or labor parties have always strived for. Um, and building on that, we, we refound our voice uh, and we, we, you know, we, we're not back where we were, uh, but the voters are giving us a second thought. They, you know, they're, they're taking us into account. We, we turned out the biggest party uh, uh, during the European election a little over a year ago. And there was also a clear message that we're still here and we're still offering an important uh, ideology to Dutch voters. Uh, if you look at next year, well, well, it's a roller coaster also in, in, in political uh, terms. At the end of last year, we, we were, uh, you know, 
even with, with Mark Rutte's party uh, in the poll. Still quite low, but, but even at, at the same uh, point. Now rally around the flag is, is, is causing his party to, you know, to ride high. Uh, and then the next general election is in March. So it will be very important to build broader coalitions and work with the Greens, work with, uh, with the, the Socialist Party, which is a bit more uh, to the left uh, than the PvdA. Maybe work with the social liberals who are in the current government are seeming very unhappy there. Uh, so they might, you know, uh, want to have some fun next time around and try if we can build a coalition that could actually win that election and not only win it to, to, to enter into government, but also to change things. And if I look at my colleagues in Europe, we've seen some spectacular rebounds from, from well, of course, uh, Spain and Portugal, uh, but also Scandinavia. And um, I would certainly hope that over the next couple of years we can, you know, fight back our way and have, have more progressive or, or labor-led governments. And then we can also change the narrative in Europe and change the dynamics and start introducing a minimum corporate tax at the European level because it's hurting us. It's hurting our workers. It's hurting uh, our economies. Uh, we can start introducing a working car carbon tax. We can start delivering uh, better protection for workers in Europe, changing labor migration from a, from a business model for the big corporations into something that's actually to the benefit of European citizens. So uh, for now, I think uh, we, we have just, that, that's of course, countries are, are not the, at the same point, but the Netherlands have, you know, has been reopening, leaving the, the lockdown step by step. And that also means that the political lockdown is, is ending. So people are once again thinking, well, maybe there are some tough choices to be made this fall and, and next year. Who do I trust with these choices? So that seems like quite a natural beginning of, of the campaign season after summer recess. And then we have to present our case to, to the Dutch people. And we could end up uh, on top or, or just, just where we are uh, uh, or where we were last time. It's quite an ex exciting and open election uh, this time. So we've had a situation where, you know, you've obviously had a difficult time as a party, but you were in quite... I, I always like the euphemisms uh, you guys uh, use. A difficult time, yes, just a bit. But you're in quite good company. I mean, there are not very many centre-left parties that have had a good decade. True. Um, if you look at the kind of international experience, are there models that you have drawn inspiration from as you've sought to rebuild your party? Oh yeah, of course, but, but, but we have always taken into account how big the differences are between countries. Uh, so it's, it's never possible to just copy paste uh, what someone else is doing. But, but I, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to, to colleagues on how they, you know, how they did it uh, to, to get this rebound. If you look at what, what Antonio Costa did in Portugal, I think it was very uh, inspiring in Portugal, but also outside of Portugal, that he was so... Uh, clear on raising pensions, raising minimum wage, uh, raising uh, welfare and still providing economic growth and, and making sure that, that this budget deficit was not, was not, you know, through the roof. And that's nice. Uh, and it's also nice that he can, you know, he said, well, from the beginning, he's been quite consistent in his policies. But also to look at uh, Mette Frederiksen in Denmark, uh, with some of our uh, colleagues, she's not so popular uh, be, because she's, she's also quite outspoken on, on issues like migration. Uh, but she told me when I visited her in Copenhagen that she spent almost a year traveling each and every community in Denmark and talking to, uh, to people and, and asking them what they, what they worry about and what they long for. And she translated that in her uh, political manifesto. So... There's, there's hopeful lessons to be learned and uh, you can see light at the end of the tunnel. You can see uh, progressive or labor parties uh, uh, picking up once again and finding their voice and finding their, also their swag and, and you know, the fun of you know, being, uh, being in politics and, and actually improving lives of voters. Uh, so I think we're, we're entering a, a little bit of a different phase right now. And there's no guarantee of success, but you know, that's democracy. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be fun.
Well, that's a, it's a great and very optimistic place to end. Um, I think we've completely run out of time, but it's been fascinating talking to you, Lodovic, um, and good luck um, in the months ahead. Thank you so much. Nice talking to you. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care.